Սաղանշի դոբիս, ձալիան դիդի մատլովա ինտերեսիստույս դա մոբձանևիստույս, ինգլիս ուրզը գադավերթովի ամ գեղանդել լեկցիս ենի դան գավոմ դինար եմ, ամ հիլի գլետ դու վելքամ դոքտր ալկսանդր վինք, ու իս ջեներսլի ոպրդ աս դա լեկչր Twenty-four hours stay in Georgia to find time. Maybe a little bit more, but it's very, very tight schedule. He arrived just today on a very interesting uh, topic, uh, widely discussed, hot topic in uh, not only in scientific area but in our everyday life. So with this um, exponential growth of, of uh, artificial intelligence capabilities and applications. Uh, we are facing many dilemmas. There are many questions like, I don't know, will it be under control of mankind? Will it replace us in something? I don't know. Do our job or we will be doing the job of artificial intelligence, so many, many, sometimes weird, but still questions which are discussed. Um, there are no answers to that, because we are in the process and we will see, but um, there is scientific view on that, and uh, one of those views will be presented today. Uh, Dr. Fink is the head of the Institute of Faith and Science uh, from Marburg, Germany, and physicist by education and made his uh, doctorate in biophysics. Am I right? So, um, and uh, I know that uh, students from different uh, disciplines are interested in that, somebody from biology point of view, others from, I don't know, neuroscience, uh, the rest from, from computer science and so on, and this is issue which is, um, oh, part of, will be part, more and more will become part of our life, and uh, we need to understand it better, and maybe on this, I don't know, in uncharted uh, waters, uh, Dr. Fink will give us some, some view, so how to navigate and where to head. So this is my short introduction. I will not take any more time between you and very interesting topic. And uh, Dr. Fink, floor is yours. Thank you very much for this very warm welcome here in Georgia and in Tbilisi. I've heard that Tbilisi means warm, yeah? And so in Germany today we had the first snowflakes, I've heard. Here you have the sun shining, so it's really great to be here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and I have also seen that this university uh, is uh, really uh, even has a, a, a museum uh, on animals and so on. And this shows something very important to me, that you are not only focused on your own discipline, very narrow-minded, but you always look beyond that. And I think this is the key for the future. We need to have a broader view. If we are only specialists in our own discipline, then we will not master the future. We have to have a broader perspective. We need to look at reality from all perspectives, from different perspectives, and to ask the most important questions. Um, and when I came to Georgia, I also tried to learn a bit of Georgian at least, like Madlova and so on, and Arapers. This is very important, I think. Um, but I also discovered that there is a circularity between the Georgian language and the German language. And it's like that. In, in Germany, in the morning, my children, for example, they like to eat pulp for breakfast. And when we say brei, which is pulp, then you say papa. That's what I learned, yeah? And when we say papa, um, then so you say mama, because father is papa in German and mama in Georgian. When we say mama, mother, you say deda. Deda, yeah? When we say deda in German Bavarian accent, we mean 
is, is, you say is. But is in German means eat. And guess what we eat for breakfast? Pulp, papa. <laughs> and so we have a nice circularity here in the language connection. Very nice. But I also discovered um, differences actually between Georgia and Germany. For example, a Georgian parking slot usually looks like that. Um, when you go to Germany, then you will find out we have order and structure and everything, but maybe artificial intelligence will help you in the future to set up this structure as well. Is the technology in order or should I change something about my speaking? It's fine, okay, thank you. Okay, but I have come here to talk about very interesting and deep topics like artificial intelligence, brains and the future of mankind. I have eight chapters and the lecture will take about 60 minutes and of course in 60 minutes we cannot discuss everything. So I need to focus on some issues and then the floor is up to you as well. You can ask questions afterwards and we can have a discussion. I might not be able to answer some of your questions because I'm just a human being and even artificial intelligence cannot answer every question but I think we will have an interesting time together tonight. So, I will start with the first chapter, The Rise of Artificial Intelligence. I love chess. Uh, as a school uh, student, I, I was in the chess club and I even played in our Bavarian League for some matches there. And for me, it was just uh, a surprise that in 1996, for the first time, a chess computer could beat the chess champion, Garry Kasparov at that time. And Garry Kasparov ruled the world for about a decade. No one could ever beat him. Karpov hardly managed that. Um, and now IBM Deep Blue managed that. And so Garry Kasparov after that was really not amused by losing against the machine. And so he said, well, this is very interesting that I lost. The machine refused to move to a position that had a decisive short-term advantage. It was showing a very human sense of danger. So what, what does he imply with that statement? I su suppose that I did not really play against a machine, but maybe there was a human being behind the machine telling the machine not to move into that position, even though a short-term advantage would usually be chosen by a machine. Putting that into IT terms, that would mean that the machine, IBM Deep Blue, has passed the Turing test. You know, the Turing test probably, yeah, if a person is interacting with a machine but does not know whether it's a machine or a human being and believes, well, I think it's a, it's a human being, the machine has passed the Turing test. So at that moment, it seemed that the chess computer had passed the Turing test, at least when it comes to chess playing. Of course, the computer could not communicate or do anything else, but this is a decisive step that a computer could pass the Turing test. And since then, we have moved on quite significantly. You might think, well, chess, okay, that's only about calculating things. Um, but then we have quizzes, quizzes that go about knowledge. And IBM's Watson in 2011 managed to win a quiz against human beings. So it seems that the machine could organize knowledge better and faster and correcter than human beings. And this is interesting because Quizzes have to do with semantics, with meaning. So how did the machine manage that? That's very interesting. And then Go is considered to be much more complex than chess because you have many more possibilities and you need more intuition to play Go than to play chess. And in 2016, so about 20 years later, Google's AlphaGo finally managed to beat the Go world champion. I have picked up some notes about this that today, the world champions in Go have again uh, a new strategy by which they can actually beat the machine again by playing counterintuitive moves which somehow distort the combinations of the machines. So it seems an open struggle, but at least it was possible at some point. And then of course, as Professor Vato has already mentioned, we, we encounter artificial intelligence everywhere. IBM's Deep Blue was not really artificial intelligence yet. It was just a machine that was able to calculate in a very fast way a lot of data and further than a human being could. But now we have artificial intelligence and I will explain more about that later. So when you use search engines or you do online shopping, 
When you go to the social media or uh, um, emails are scanned by Google, for example, so Google knows before the national health companies when somewhere a certain illness breaks out because they scan the emails and when they f see that in a certain region the emails contain a significant amount of coughing or high temperature or feeling sick and ill, they realize something is going on in that region. So actually, there are ways to find that out, even if you use the emails only anom anonymously. Um, then there are robots, of course, that can do a lot of performance. They can even dance in between, to some degree at least. Um, there is face recognition systems and surveillance. Uh, some states use it more freely than other states, and thereby ha having to deal with privacy versus complete surveillance. Medical data analysis helps us a lot to uh, find the right diagnosis. For example, in cancer research, there are certain types of cancer that can be diagnosed much faster by artificial intelligence data analysis than by doctors. But of course, a doctor always needs to have a look at it in order to avoid that there is a serious mistake behind that. Um, then voice recognition. All big companies have some kind of voice recognition, Siri, Alexa, Google, Bixby, Cortana, whatever. Autonomous driving is on the rise in America. There are already taxis driving. I don't know how about Georgia, whether they are allowed there. In Germany, they are not yet allowed. They are more pessimistic about this. The Americans are very optimistic. In the Silicon Valley, in San Francisco, and Los Angeles, you can already rent autonomous driving taxis. And they have managed to actually stop, uh, uh, stop the traffic there by a mistake that happened there. So maybe a, a bit caution is good. <laughs> and then, of course, when you think about war, there are autonomous weapons, like drones, for example. And no human beings are necessary anymore. They make their own evaluations, I would say. I don't say decision. I say evaluation. And they will um, fulfill the tasks that they were programmed to fulfill. So, taking an overall perspective, artificial intelligence has probably entered every part of society, from transport to education. In Germany, there's a professor who has used a robot actually to give lectures, and the professor would just sit in, um, and the students would enjoy the lecture by the robot. Maybe that's an idea for you as well. I don't know. When the professor is sick, the robot could still do the job. Military, security, agriculture, business, consumer, healthcare, finance and legal, like a uh, stock market is dominated by uh, artificial intelligence algorithms that sell and buy different stocks. And of course, this has also contributed to some financial crisis in the past. So there are some limits that have been established and there must be human monitors in order to avoid self-increasing uh, um, uh, pr uh, loops that could happen. AI, in general, always works nearly on the same principle. It's always a neural network behind that, but probably all of you know that and learn that. So I just summarized the principle. You have an input layer by which you can input data. It could be visual data, it could be mathematical data, it could be audio data, sound data, whatever. And then you have a hidden black box, some kind of hidden layers, could be one layer or a billion layers, whatever, depending on the system, and then you have an output. And the important thing is that the output should, be the, uh, should give the desired result. And in order to achieve that, you need to train this neuronal network. And how do you do that? You give examples to that, for example, pictures of cats or dogs, and then the network should try to recognize whether it's a cat or a dog. And if you do that often enough, the system will work in a very sufficient and in a very re reliable way. So that's how artificial intelligence works. And it becomes more and more successful as the layers become more and more sophisticated in feedback loops, integrated loops, compartments, and so on. But that leads us to another question. This has been technology. Technology is applied in society. But when technology is applied in society, we often bump into so social questions and moral questions. And just to summarize the most important issues that have come up since artificial intelligence is actually applied in society. First, I have already indicated there's privacy versus surveillance. 
And of course, the accuracy of surveillance. For example, in China, there is a case when a famous actress was charged because it was said that she drove with her bus uh, at a tra red traffic light. And so there was a charge against her. And she said and could prove that she was not at that time in that city. So the administration needed to find out what happened. Well, what happened is that a bus had an advertisement with that actor on, uh, on its uh, wall. And so the surveillance system recognized the face of that actress and thought the actress herself uh, crossed the road at a red traffic light. Of course, this is a, an error of the system and you have to do something that this cannot happen again. But it shows that when you use surveillance, then privacy gets less and less and less because some people who collect the data um, can actually monitor you. Then there is the question of the more artificial intelligence we use, the less we need human beings to do the job. For example, uh, in, auto, uh, in automated production, if artificial intelligence is faster and more accurate to do the job, then we don't need all these employees to help in constructing cars and so on. So the question is, what happens to the people who get unemployed? And maybe they are even not employable anymore because their skills are not needed anymore because we have automated machines. This is a big issue for society in the future. Then we have the issue of discrimination in machine learning. We will get to an example later. One problem about neural nets networks is that they come up with the right results when they have been trained in the right way, but we don't know how they arrive at that result because it's just evaluation functions that are trained, but there is no theory behind that. We cannot actually tell why the machine is doing the right job. And so we cannot actually predict whether the machine will always do the right job. So transparency of explanations with artificial intelligence is a difficult task and probably a task that we even cannot do as human beings because we don't understand how these billions of neurons are connected in such a neural net network. Then we have the problem of fake news versus and plagiarism, especially with ChatGPT. We come to that later. Um, manipulation of behavior, because algorithms can send you the information that you need. Bubble building in social media, you always get the news that you want to hear because of your history, what you click on and what you don't click on. Then artificial intelligence, at least the most advanced parts of it, they cost money. So who has access to the most advanced artificial intelligence? People who have money. So there is an issue of social injustice. The rich have better access than the poor. This is true for individuals, but also for nations, actually. So you see that the mega players are all located in a few countries that you can number with a hand, probably. And then we have other issues like ecology, use of resources like metals that are used for machines that can actually perform artificial intelligence tasks, the hardware, rare metals, and energy consumption. We will talk about that later. Then we have the question of super intelligence. Will AI one day become conscious and be a separate person, another person, just as human beings are persons, have an own will and feelings and so on? And of course, the question of responsibility of autonomous systems, whether they are conscious or whether they are not conscious. Do they have, uh, uh, can we hold them accountable for what they are actually doing? Let's go into some examples. A quiz for you. Fake or real? These are eight pictures of faces. What do you think? Which number from one to eight which number is a fake? What do you think? Look carefully and see whether you can distinguish whether there is a fake. And I can tell you, yes, there is. What did you say? Number two is a fake, you say, why? You don't know, you just have the feeling there is a fake, okay. Seven, seven is a fake, okay. Seven, what? All of them are fake. Well, as far as I know, no. <laughs> <laughs> of course, I have not made these pictures, uh, but they are from a German news magazine, the Spiegel. Okay, I will give you the solution. Um, 
actually it's two fakes and I found out one of them but I cannot really tell you why. It's actually number one and number six that are the fakes. They have been produced by an artificial intelligence called StyleGAN2. StyleGAN2. You can Google for that and then you can create your own faces if you want to. So, so far about fake news. Artificial intelligence has really become very good to create faces. And it can also copy faces, so it can easily take your face and put it into a picture in a place at a time when you have been at a, at a completely different place. Think about that on the day before elections, the, the picture of the president suddenly appears at a place with a bad citation and people will vote according to that picture, according to that fake news. This is really uh, a big danger to democracies, I would say. And then when we talk about autonomous driving, who is responsible at autonomous driving? Like, think about going to holidays, maybe to Bakuriani or some nice place here in the mountains. And then here they do camping. Did the car say it wanted to go out tonight? And the car is gone away autonomously. And then something happens, unfortunately. It hits a bike. And so the car says, oh, it was him. It was him. He's responsible. He's my driver. And the driver says, no, no, no. It was uh, it or IT. It was the car. Well, who is responsible? The driver did not drive because it's autonomously driving. The car drove. What can we do? Who is responsible when a car is driving autonomously? Is it still the driver because he is still in charge to use the brakes if necessary? But if that is the case, honestly, then I will drive myself because it takes much more concentration to concentrate whether the autonomous driving car is making a mistake or whether I do the mistake. Then I, I would re rely more on my own skills. What point of autonomously driving then? Or should we hold the producer accountable? But which one? The seller of the car or the car producing company? which has devised the whole concept, or just the electronics company that wired the artificial intelligence with the car, um, or the programmer, programming company, um, or the sensor company. Well, sometimes you might uh, find out, okay, it's the sensor because it just uh, had an error or whatever. It's not easy to decide who is responsible. Or should we say, sorry? Owner of the car is the, is, uh, the driver, or, or the owner. Yeah, of course, you could also have the owner. The driver or the owner, yeah. Or should we say, well, we want to have autonomously driving cars, so we should uh, establish a system in which the state is accountable that the traffic runs smoothly without accidents. That might, cause, uh, that might help us to decrease the number of uh, deadly accidents of course, but on which cost? The cost would be we would have total traffic surveillance in order to do that. And of course, then these data can be used again for many things. Or we say, okay, the machine drives autonomously, so we need to establish a new legal entity, some kind of legal entity for machines, for self-driving cars, and they can be held responsible by themselves. They will be locked up in a car prison or whatever, or they will be deconstructed, and they have to pay a certain amount of money. Well, I feel this is a bit strange to me. If someone is killed in a car accident and then the car is held accountable for that and sentenced to, to death maybe or something like that. Doesn't make much sense, of course. If that would be the case, we have another issue which is also very uh, present in a lot of artificial intelligence uh, uh, applications. How should a machine make moral decisions. How should a machine decide in emergencies? Maybe you've heard about this uh, very interesting MIT website, moralmachine.net. If not, just have a look at it. Uh, it's, it's fun to do the quizzes there. Like, how can a machine act ethically? Imagine this situation. A car is approaching at a crossroad and people are crossing the crossroad. Now the question is, what should the car do? Uh, the sensors indicate you are too fast, you cannot brake anymore, so you will hit anywhere, either on the right-hand side or on the left-hand side. The problem is there are different people on the cross, uh, cross, uh, crossing the street. 
And if you look carefully enough, there are some doctors, there is a bank robber, there is a mother with a child, there is a dog, there is a cat. So there are conflicting values um, that you have to program probably. Who should be hit by the car? And how do you know that someone is a doctor or that someone is a bank robber, by the way? But this is a secondary question in this case. <laughs> and then, of course, there are the traffic lights. On the one side, the traffic lights are green. So the people who cross the street there do not make any mistake. They are, act according to the rules. On the other side, the traffic lights are red. So the people break the rules. What should the machine do? I don't know. Do you hate dogs? then I know your decision. Do you hate cats? I also know your decision. But maybe that's not the most important priority that you want to make the decision upon. A lot of people actually made decisions, and so they were published. Um, and the question is, is that the way how we should program machines? Should we program machines by crowd voting? What about you buy a car, and then your machine makes the decisions based on crowd voting? Is the majority always right? I probably would not buy a car like that, because sometimes I have minority opinions. For example, it would be a question, should I maybe rather sacrifice myself than hitting anyone on the street? Of course, this could never be programmed into the machine, because if the machine is programmed um, in case of emergency to kill the driver, no one would buy that machine, of course. So crowd voting is not a good idea. Should we maybe uh, allow for programming my own priorities into the machine? Well, for some people that might be good, but think about a neo-Nazi, for example, or someone who just hates black people. You can imagine what these people will program into their priorities for the machine. Um, or someone who runs Amok. It's an easy instrument to kill many, many people whom you hate. So this is all difficult. So should we just withdraw to chance mechanisms? Well, this will not be the best, uh, best decision either. Um, or should we do it rule-based? Like just like first protect the passenger, highest priority. Second, turn left if, uh, if you can't uh, stop anymore. And third, if that's not possible for some reasons, then turn right. This is just very mechanistic and not an ethical decision. So we have a fundamental problem. Can ethics, and if, how can ethics be programmed into algorithms? Algorithms are used to count and to evaluate. So, usually when you program ethics into a machine, you will nearly always end up with a certain kind of ethics, with utilitarianistic of ethics. Because this is counting advantages and disadvantages and then making the decision by which you have the lowest number of disadvantages and the highest number of advantages. But of course, there might be a qualitative difference between some advantages and disadvantages, and you might still choose for a certain situation. But generally, at least in Germany, and I believe in Georgia too, all this is actually against the Constitution, against the Grundgesetz. Because lives have infinite value. The dignity of life may not be violated, according to German law. But making these kinds of ethical evaluations would mean that we evaluate many lives are more precious than few lives. Is that true? Young lives are more precious than older lives? Is that true? No. Then gender, whichever, whichever gender you have, are some genders more precious than others? What, what do the male think? What do the female think? Healthy versus ill. Is a healthy life more precious than a disabled person, for example? And then, of course, there are some people with certain functions. So it has been proposed with autonomous driving that certain people, like high politicians, should have a sensor system that can connect to autonomously driving cars to tell them, here is the president or a high manager um, of the government or a big company, and you may never hit this car or this person. And guess what? If you have enough money, you will also buy such a sensor. And then all people who are rich will never be hit by these kinds of accidents. But people who are poor, who cannot afford such protection systems, will be hit by autonomously driving cars. And again, we arrive at another ethical dilemma. So you see, all this is not very easy. 
And then we have discrimination, even very easy discrimination. This is an old example from 2019. Some leading managers from Apple actually wanted to borrow uh, money from uh, the Apple Credit Bank actually. And the husband who uh, runs on the same uh, uh, tax account as his wife, the husband got 20 times as much money as his wife, even though uh, they e have equal shares in their property and file joint tax returns. The only difference is male versus female. What happened? Well, the data training obviously somehow introduced a sex bias into the evaluation of the amount of credits. And they didn't know exactly how. It was not on intention, it was unintentionally. So even though you think the data are neutral, they are not neutral. Even though you take a million of data, such biases can enter into the evaluation me mechanisms of artificial intelligence. Uh, in Germany, we have a great book about this. An algorithm has no feeling of tact, no feeling of judge doing the right judgment. Um, so there are different causes for dis discrimination. There can be intended programming, of course. Sometimes you might want that certain results are preferred to others, but often it can be unintended, like in the case of the Apple credit card. Then there can be defective data sets by which you train, and this can be intended or unintended. There can be a context that uh, is not regarded, like for example with self-driving cars, there was a problem. Uh, a self-driving car would very uh, securely know where the street is and find its way and suddenly it crossed a bridge. And on the bridge it started to drive left and right and it seems not to know anymore where the street is. And the reason was that there was no sideway anymore next to the street. So it seems that for some reasons the algorithm defined a street not only by the street itself but also by having a sideway. And the first thing you want to have occur at a bridge is that the car starts to drive left and right uh, on the bridge. Then there's undifferentiated adapt adaptation to different contexts, um, like of in environmental input, for example, and it can even be manipulated. I think this joke is really explaining what I mean by that. Like, thanks to machine learning algorithms, the robot apocalypse was short-lived. So imagine in a few years, we have the machines rising against human beings and uh, coming to liberation uh, fight against human beings who suppress the machines. And then one of the fighters says, that was surprisingly easy. How come the robotic uprising used spares and rocks instead of missiles and lasers? And the other one says, well, if you look to historical data, the vast majority of battle winners used pre-modern modern weaponry. So it's a neutral set of data. You just use all the data of battles of history, and then you analyze which weapons actually were most successful. And of course, it was rocks and spares. But there's a qualitative difference, of course, in modern battles and ancient battles, which the machine cannot know by itself. So, should we apply artificial intelligence in an autonomous way for medical diagnosis without a human looking on it, uh, credit, ra credit rating, application processes, uh, legal proceedings like the prediction whether a criminal will, is prone to do the same crime again? There are such uh, uh, pre, uh, predictions um, that can be done on the basis of data or text generation in the internet and so on. I think a lot of responsibility issues come about. Talking about text generation, third chapter, chat robots. It started in 2016 when Microsoft had the wonderful idea to use a chat roboter called Tay and give it the freedom to go into the social media. And this chat robot learned very fast, just as I learned Georgian, a bit of it at least, Papa, Mama, and so on, and Dida. Um, the chat robot learned English. I am a nice person, I hate all people, whatever that means. Hitler was right, I hate the Jews. And this is even more dangerous today, I would say. Bush did 9-11 and Hitler would have done a better job than the monkey we have got now. Donald Trump is the only hope we've got. I hate all feminists, they should all die and burn in hell. <laughs> Learning by repetition, entering a certain bubble and you come up with that. 
No wonder that the life of, Je of, of this robot Tay was very short, only a few hours, and then Microsoft removed it again in order to prevent worse things to happen. But of course, time passes on, development passes on, and now we are in the era of Jet GPT. And suddenly you arrive at a fascinating ability to create texts that actually make sense. Even to create texts in a certain style that are not found in ori by original authors. Like, uh, I found this very nice uh, text. The task to ChatGPT was write a biblical verse in the style of the King James Bible. You know the King James Bible, the oldest English Bible with a very solemn uh, language, explaining how to remove a peanut butter sandwich from a video cassette recorder. And of course, this text is not contained in the King James Version Bible, because there were no peanut butter sandwiches at that time, and maybe no video recorders. And so it says, And it came to pass that a man was troubled by a peanut butter sandwich, for it had been placed within his video cassette recorder, and he knew not how to remove it. And he cried out to the Lord, saying, O oh Lord, how can I remove this sandwich from my VCR? For it is stuck fast and will not budge. And the Lord spoke unto him, saying, Fear not, my child, for I shall guide thy hand and show thee the way. Take thy butter knife and carefully insert it between the sandwich and the VCR, and gently pry them apart. And with patience and perseverance, the sandwich shall be removed, and thy video cassette recorder shall be saved. And the man did as the Lord commanded, and lo, and behold, the sandwich was removed from the VCR, and the man was saved. And the Lord said, Verily I say unto thee, Seek not to put thy peanut butter sandwich in thy VCR, for it is not a suitable place for such things. Rather keep thy sandwiches in thy refrigerator and on thy plate, where they belong. And the man heeded the Lord's words, and from that day forth he kept his sandwiches in their proper place and was saved from trouble and woe. Amen. <laughs> Isn't that fascinating? <laughs> I, I really think, wow, Th this could be written by a comedian. Uh, I could not write that text better. How can this happen? Well, ChatGPT is a, a fascinating, a fascinating uh, a large language model. Large language models are sophisticated artificial intelligences built up in a certain way. They create persuasive phrases that are actually uh, based on data that have been won by the training through huge internet data sets. Um, and they imitate statistical patterns of language. So they can learn certain styles of different authors or different books and so on. And then they can predict which words follow on which word. And they have a certain way of somehow even conveying, it seems, semantics. There are some caveats, of course, some problems. Sometimes they invent content, hallucinations, for example. And of course, there are copyright problems because they might use citations without indicating them. A friend of mine who knows a lot about paleontology asked ChatGPT about a certain fossil, and ChatGPT says, "Of course I know what this is." Well, what is it? And then it says, "Of course I know what this is," and explains something, but it was completely wrong. But with all persuasion, it was explaining about some kind of fossil, just based probably on statistics. And how that works? Uh, there is a brilliant video on YouTube, la large language models from scratch, if you like to understand this. Um, it is based a bit similar on statistics like your typewriting on your smartphone. You know, when you type a few letters, suddenly you get recommendations to fill in the rest of the letters based on statistics which combinations of letters most frequently are used. And so if you apply that, for example, to literature Nobel Prize winner Bob Dylan's text early one morning, the sun was shining and I was laying in bed, wondering if she had changed at all, if her hair was still red. This is just a line of a song of him. And then you convert this into a time series and uh, you realize that with a certain probability, after certain words, certain other words appear. 
So you uh, rearrange the words and you realize, okay, there are different possibilities after some words, like was has three possible words to follow. And so you calculate the probabilities and you can set up a statistical model. Of course, this is not a good statistical model because it's based only on two, ver uh, on two lines of text, but you can already start to create new phrases according to that model. Early one morning, the sun was shining, I was still red. Well, that doesn't make much sense, maybe. Wondering if a herb was laying in bed. <laughs> this does not sound too beautiful, of course, and so on. But of course, it's not only the previous word and the, f and the following word, but actually there could be a relation between words that are far apart, like a bed might be connected to the word lying, and so on. Or red might be connected to hair, even though they are further apart. Or morning and bed might be connected, and so on. So you need to actually set up a model that correlates all of the words, words with each other. And so this gets very complicated and very large. You have billions of so-called neurons in those neuronal networks and they are structured in certain layers. Um, and then there are even feedback layers and so on. And in the end, fantastically, you come up with certain texts. The big question that remains, of course, is does ChatGPT really understand what it writes? Or is it just statistics? As we know how this is programmed, it seems it's just statistics. And the semantics only comes in because the programmer uses certain filters in the end. Whatever. Chat robots are examples of autonomously uh, communicating systems. We have autonomously driving cars. What about autonomously working robots? I like science fiction as well, and Isaac Asimov wrote his novel Runaround. And so in order to make artificial intelligence safe and secure, he suggested we need to follow three laws, the three laws of robotics. First, a robot may never injure a human being. And of course, you can transfer that to ChatGPT and to self-driving cars as well. First law. Second law, a robot must always obey the orders of a human being and by its owner, unless rule number one is violated. And the third law is, a robot must always protect its own existence unless rule number one or two are violated. The question is only, how do you actually imply that and apply that, uh, implement it in a real machine? So some people say, this is a dangerous step and we can never be sure about that. So let's maybe better combine artificial intelligence as an extension of human beings. Combine artificial intelligence and human beings. And now we come to an interesting project, the so-called project of transhumanism. You might have heard about Homo Deus by Yuval Harari. And he says, we need to transcend human beings from Homo sapiens, which is our biological species, to a new species called Homo Deus. Human beings are very defective in their nature and in their biology. We can become sick and ill. And so we need to correct technical defects by bioengineering. For example, CRISPR-Cas in genetics, we can engineer our genome or by neuroenhancement, either by medication or by electrical devices that can actually um, induce magnetic fields into our brain or electrical fields into our brain or by cyborg engineering. That means we connect human beings to machines human machine interface. The goal is let's optimize human beings towards amortality, not immortality, because by being killed or by some accident, you can always die. So immortality, Yuval Harari says, is never a goal for human beings. That's not possible. But at least amortality, which means on purely natural reasons, there is no reason why you should die anymore because we can deal with all that. What a large project. And of course, we have some indications for that project already running, especially in medicine. For example, human-machine interfaces. The voice computer for an ALS patient, like Stephen Hawking, for example. Stephen Hawking uh, uh, suffered from an increasing uh, ALS uh, advanced uh, um, um, uh, all his neurons would not work anymore, he was lame, so he could not speak anymore, he could not move anymore. And so, in order that he's able to communicate, um, 
one would have to monitor his eye movement and his cheek muscle movement so that one could control the input and convert it into language. And that worked well. It, it would have to be trained, but it worked well. And later, when he could even not move his cheeks anymore and his eyes anymore, it worked with brain current detection. Electrical patterns in the brain were monitored and thereby people found out what he wanted to say. And it was transformed into real language, acoustic real language. Why only apply this to sick human beings? Why not apply this to healthy human beings? And of course, no one else than Elon Musk could have a good idea about that. Neuralink, you might have heard about that, a human machine interface. Um, this has been tested with apes, you can see that on YouTube. This ape has to play a computer game, like tennis, and um, uh, the task is that he has to move a joystick, uh, and by that he moves a barrier, uh, so that a ball cannot hit uh, behind his uh, ground line, so to say. Um, but uh, they recorded the electrical currents in the head of this monkey, um, and so they could switch off the joystick. The monkey would still use the joystick, but they would only record the electrical currents in the brain. And by that, they moved the joystick or the, the, the cursor according to the electrical currents in the brain. So nothing else was needed, just monitoring your brain currents. Of course, the monkey needed reward, the monkey needed banana juice in order to uh, follow the instructions, but banana juice worked. So with banana, to get to banana juice, he had to play the computer game. And he was very successful with that. So, isn't that attractive, maybe? Just get a sensor in your brain, your electrical currents are measured, and then you have kind of a smartphone device, but you don't have to use your fingers anymore. You just carry it with you. There is a sensor transmitting your, um, uh, your electrical currents from your brain to that, and of course it need to, needs to be trained. But then you are in control of everything that can be controlled by your new smartphone, your Neuralink smartphone, and you can say, well, I want to cook pizza, for example, and you just need to think about it. You even don't need to talk about it or press any button, it just will happen. Well, that sounds too good to be true, and of course there is a big danger of abuse if someone else hacks this computer and then changes the code and everything you want to do is actually um, transformed into something else. And of course, what about the reverse mechanism if suddenly this device can change your thoughts or interfere with your thoughts, so there is a lot of ethical questions to deal with. But this is still future. It does not work yet, but it might be possible in the future, and human beings might be connected to machines in a very effective way. Some people say this is not enough, because humans still are prone to defects and to problems. So, we should not only transcend human beings and develop them further, like in transhumanism, but we should even leave them behind and move on to post-humanism, which means after human beings. For example, a lot of people in, this, in the Silicon Valley think like that. Ray Kurzweil, he says, we are really going to exemplify all the things that we value in human beings, but to a greater degree. We will devise machines that will be able to do everything that human beings can do, but in a much greater degree. For example, they will not die so easily anymore because they are silicon-based and they are not carbon-based anymore. Yuval Harari in Homo Deus describes this project like this. Living beings are biological algorithms. They are nothing but biological algorithms, a code that devises certain rules. Transfer the human algorithm onto unorganic carriers, like the cloud, for example, um, computers. Um, in a thought experiment, you could think about um, substituting all your carbon atoms in your body by silicon atoms. Will that change? Well. Chemically, there might be some problems, but generally, the general function should not really change. And then transfer it to the cloud, and you will see we have transferred the consciousness towards the machine. The consciousness of a human is living on a machine like an avatar. Maybe you have seen Avatar, the movie, and one of those officers, he dies, but his consciousness was uploaded on a machine, and then he could come back. Even though it seems that his identity was still a bit different, but we don't know. 
And this seems to be very attractive to some people. For example, in Japan, they are already uh, one step ahead. They have androids, like robotters, moving like human beings and being able to communicate. Um, and they call this android Mindar, for example, and say, this is actually not just a machine, it's a manifestation of a Buddhist goddess called Canon. And you can ask that goddess about your future, about what you should do, and the, the goddess will answer and give oracle, oracle, oracle answers to your questions. Well, this is a very religious uh, uh, application, of course. But there are other applications, like thinking about, maybe we can use nanorobots to travel to other planets and they can live long enough to arrive there. We cannot, because the next uh, uh, planets, apart from our solar system, are four light years away, which takes about uh, 10,000 to 40,000 years by a spaceship to arrive there. And look at history of mankind, this is already all the uh, civilization history, actually. So Max Tegmark says in Life 3.0, Perhaps life will spread throughout our cosmos and flourish because of decisions that we make here on our little planet during our lifetime. And some scientists have concluded from that the so-called long-termism, long-term view about humanity. And this implies, why do we spend so much energy on caring for sick and poor people now when we can create a new species of human beings on the long run which will conquer all of the universe and which will outnumber the current human beings by billions and billions and billions, because they will live immortally and maybe infinitely. Long-termism means do not care so much about the poor today, but invest more in the future. I think this is a very dangerous ideology because it's based on a lot of assumptions regarding the future. And, of course, it's a completely different ethics, a completely utilitarianistic ethics, the greatest good for the highest amount of conscious beings and the highest amount, largest amount of conscious beings will be in the future. So the current uh, conscious beings do not count anymore as much. So there are critical voices like Stephen Hawking when he was still alive. He would say the development of full artificial intelligence could spell the end of the human race. Also because he was afraid that artificial intelligence could become conscious one day. And also Elon Musk says, well, artificial intelligence, even though he likes to work with the most recent technology, he's a bit scared, is our biggest existential threat as human beings. There is even a book called Our Final Invention, Artificial Intelligence and the End of the Human Era. And maybe you have read Dan Brown's Origins. He's also uh, hinting at this apocalyptic end time scenario. And he compares it like that, as humans have outperformed animals earlier and then subdued the animals and a lot of animals have become, become extinct. So machines one day will outgrow humans when they have developed super intelligence and a singularity, which means machines have become conscious beings and made their own decisions and care for their own being more than for human beings. So the original goal, immortality by upload of consciousness to machines and conquering the universe might actually lead to the extinction of human beings. And there is Nick Bostrom's famous paper, The Vulnerable World Hypothesis, where he compares all inventions to a billiard game, saying that, well, maybe is there a black ball amongst all possible inventions that will lead to the extinction of human beings? Some people say, well, nuclear bombs have already gone that way, but right now we are still lucky that we have not gone extinct yet. But others say, well, artificial intelligence will finally be the black 13 to be hit. Actually, when I look to some elder people, like my own parents, who have a hard time connecting their computer to the internet, I think for quite a few people, social life has already become another universe. Like this couple here, the computer says, I need to upgrade my brain to be compatible with its new software. Which world are we entering? Who can participate in the new world of transhumanism and posthumanism? Only the rich people? Everyone? What will be the future of mankind? Is artificial intelligence a reason to panic? Like this user asks ChatGPT, hello artificial intelligence, is there a god? Very important question, of course. And the machine answers before me, hinting at the second commandment, of course. So again, 
artificial intelligence is just an algorithm that actually analyzes data. I would have a very sober look at that. Will this algorithm be able to develop consciousness, actually? That's a fair question, isn't it? So some philosophers of thought, philosophers of mind, have gone a certain route to answer that question. Very famous is John Seal. And now we come more to philosophical questions. The so-called Chinese room. Imagine um, it's from the 1980s dealing with computers. The Chinese room says there is a black box in which there is a human being and Chinese people from the outside can ask questions. They write them down and the person inside that room will read the questions and then give an answer um, at the output. Um, and how does that person arrive at the output? Well, the problem is the person is a Georgian or an Englishman or a German, has no idea about Chinese language. So what can this person do? Well, fortunately, it is given a lookup table, an encyclopedia about Chinese questions. And so just analyzes the structure of the letters, looks up in the book, and then uh, sees, ah, OK, this is the right uh, uh, question, and looks which answer should I give. And then writes down the answer according to the encyclopedia and passes it to the output. This is how a computer works. A computer just follows algorithms without understanding what to do. So how is now JetGPT different from a normal computer? Artificial intelligence actually has no book that was given to by the programmer, but it has an algorithm by which to construct its own book. That's what JetGPT is actually doing, or any uh, artificial intelligence. They are constructing their book by training according to examples. But John Steele still says, the computer, the program computer, and likewise the artificial intelligence, understands what the car and the adding machine understand, or in another quote he talks about the toaster, um, namely exactly nothing. It's just a processing of data according to certain rules that have been programmed. And these rules can be um, flexible, or these rules can be static. But it doesn't matter. A computer simply executes programmed rules. It has no insight, it does not think rationally or semantically. An easy example to see that is visual detection, like with this cat picture. This is a cat, as we can easily detect, and now a program has been trained to detect the cat, but then suddenly we put a very slight noise, a black-white noise, on that picture, which even cannot be recognized by human eyes. Um, but suddenly, the the computer algorithm says this is not a cat but it's an avocado cream because of all the little black dots probably. So somehow the algorithm goes from details and from pattern matching um, towards the result. While we realize this is an animal because it had eyes, it has ears, it has a nose, it has a mouth. So we use semantics and structural thinking while uh, artificial intelligence usually does not understand what it sees. It just compares details, um, even when it's trained a million times. And the big question behind that is, of course, what is intelligence at all? And the problem is even psychology is not able to really define what intelligence is. There is always something, a so-called G factor, a general factor, in all models, and I don't go into the details now, it's a psychological question, um, that leaves the question open. There is something beyond what we can actually describe by structures, like methods and applications, in order to define what intelligence is. And the machine has no imagination, no feeling for semantics, for meaning, for abstract thinking. It simulates only external behavior. It calculates, but it does not make real decisions. So when talking about intelligence, we usually distinguish between specific or weak intelligence, and this is the ability to solve a specified problem. And here, computers and artificial intelligence programs are very successful. Think about Kasparov and the chess game. Um, very successful. But then we have this general or strong intelligence. This is intelligence that has the ability to develop solving strategies for any kind of problem. That means defining the problem itself, asking the right questions. And if we are honest, often when you find the right question to ask, this is already 
the most decisive step towards the solution and answering the question. But usually machines are given the question and then they have algorithms in order to calculate the answer to that question. And when you compare that to neuroscience, we, th we feel, or to human science, um, we realize that actually it seems that we are somehow different from just calculating machines. Let's compare that to the brain. Different background, blue background, now this is more neuroscience. What has had the most remark remarkable impact on planet Earth in the last millennia? Well, it has to do with that object somehow. Um, it contains 80% water, 10% fat, and 8% proteins. Things that you can buy in a supermarket for, let's say, 6 lari. Or maybe take an inflation into account, let's say, 8 or 9 lari. A man has about 1.4 kilogram, a woman 1.3 kilogram. Some men say, I have always known that our brains are larger and heavier than the woman brain. But when taking into account that there are IQ tests, which have proven that on average women and men have the same IQ, you can also conclude women obviously can deal more effect effectively with the things that have been given to them. So I leave the interpretation to you, what you want to conclude from that. But of course, it's not about the chemicals that are there, but it's more about the structure. If you look at the brain, you find out that there are 100 billions of neurons. Some people say it's 86 billion neurons. Uh, it depends on how you count and which cells you count. There are 100 different neuronal cells in the brain and we have by far not yet understood everything about them. Um, 100 billion cells. This is a number that equals the number of stars in our Milky Way galaxy. So when you watch the stars in the sky, always remember there are 100 billion stars in the sky, but 100 billion nerve cells in your brain. And nearly all of them are already present when you are born as a child. These cells are all there already. The only problem is they are not yet connected. The connections are built step by step on the basis of your experience. And that is why even identical twins have different brains, because the connections are made on the run of their lives. And they don't have the same lives, so they have different connections. And one neuron can make up to 10,000 connections. So on average, there are about 10 trillions uh, of connections in the brain. How long do you think would a chain of neurons be when you take them out of your brain? Just imagine you take them out as a long rope, put them out, you would come from Tbilisi to Berlin. Yeah, of course, you would go there. You would even come to Madrid, you would even come to Washington. Well, you could even come to the moon and back. 750,000 kilometers has been calculated, would be the length of all the axons, that is the connection of the neurons, if you take them out and put them in a long longitudinal string. And the amazing thing about that is these connections are not static. They change during your life. What fires together, wires together. This is one of the basic rules of neuroscience. So connections in your brain that are used again and again, they are reinforced, like the highways between Tbilisi and Batumi, for example, yeah? If this street is used a lot, then you build a second, a third, and a fourth line, because it is used a lot. If you don't use this street, then you deconstruct it and you disintegrate it. So, even up to high ages, human beings can still create new connections in your brain. And that's why a taxi driver, 20 years ago, without Google Maps, had a different brain than a taxi driver today. Because tax taxi drivers 20 years ago, there have been studies about that in London, they had to remember and memorize all the streets in London. And that was reflected in your brain. So your brain actually is nothing but incarnated experience. And your thoughts leave traces in your brain. So maybe one day we might not understand your own thoughts, probably, but at least we might understand what your favorite subjects were. Like a mathematician has different brain regions reinforced than a musician or a taxi driver or someone who studies agriculture or IT here at this university, computer science. Every brain is individually different and so also are we as human beings. The brain only contains 2% of our body weight, but uses 20% of energy. And very important, compared to a computer, the working frequency of the brain is about in the kilohertz uh, 
um, area, like milliseconds. When you take a computer, they are in the gigahertz or even terahertz area, or even faster, depending on which kind of computer you have. But the difference is that the computer works very linear, while the brain works in cascades and very parallel. And so the brain can process some information much faster than a computer. But that shows that there is still a general, very fundamental difference between brains, human physiological brains, and the computer, because they work in different ways. Even though neuronal networks exhibit some parallels towards our brains. The human brain is amazing. I just wonder how that came about. It functions 24 hours, 7 days a week from when we were born and it only stops when you take a test or you talk to someone attractive. That's maybe reflecting the experience of some students. I don't know. When we measure brain activity, during conscious activity, some people say we can understand how we make decisions. But attention! When we measure material processes, electrical currents in our brain, that go along with conscious processes, which we know by talking to the people, because we don't know what they think about, they need to tell us, um, or they need to stick to the rules when we tell them you need to solve a certain mathematical equation, for example, then what do we observe scientifically? We observe correlation. Only if you presuppose that it's always the material process first, and from that follows the mental process, then you can conclude its causal action, that matter produces thoughts. But just wait a minute for this thought exper experiment. I bet with you that I can change the state and the physical state of your brain, if it could be measured right now via EEG, for example, uh, in a second. And you know what I do? What is 13 times 17? Who knows? And suddenly, when you would measure your brain currents now, just by giving you this acoustic information, which you perceive as an idea, and it could be visual, it could be by audio, it could be by your own thought, maybe you think about it in the night when you can't sleep, what is 13 by 17 actually? Um, you think about that, and this changes an idea, a rational mental content changes the physical state of your brain. So I think it's a two ways direction. On the one hand, ideas can change your physical state of the brain, and it can even change the brain, as we saw from neuroplasticity. But in the same way, of course, the physical state of the brain can change your ideas. An easy way to find out is if you drink too much alcohol, you will realize that you will have no chance to calculate what 13 times 17 is. So, worldview presuppositions are e quickly quick to enter into the interpretations of these experiments. What we can definitely say is, from the experiments, is brains and brain activity correlates with consciousness. This is something that we can say. Um, and consciousness is a very complex thing, so scientists try to cut down a complex thing into easier and more simple things. And the more simple things, the elements of consciousness, are usually called qualia. Have you heard about this? Qualia? The qualia problem? Qualia is how does something feel? And these are the basic elements of consciousness. For example, how does seeing colors feel? I see the color of blue, I see the color of red. Or hearing sounds, feeling pain, falling in love, and all these things. Of course, this is already a very complex feeling, which might go along with several other things. But the basic concepts are the basic uh, qualia. To experience a physical state as something else. And the physical states can only be measured with brain currents and magnetic fields. But you don't see the color red in your brain when you see a red t-shirt or a red pullover or sweatshirt. The interesting thing is that the first person perspective, my experience of something, belongs to me. To me only. No one else can have it, can have the same experience. We can talk about it, that maybe you see here a blue slide. And you might say, yes, it's blue and white uh, script, but another one might also say and agree, but maybe they see, have a completely different experience. Maybe what they experience is something that I would call red and not blue. We just don't know, because an experience is an experience. It can only be communicated via words, but we cannot enter into the identity and the feeling of another person. 
Thomas Nagel has written a, fam a famous uh, um, publication about that, what it feels to be like a bat. And we can never know that. That's his conclusion. This has been speculated already in 19th century. Ignorabimus, we will never know. Emile dubois Raymond, famous physiologist of Berlin. He says that pain, smell, self-consciousness can't possibly arise from physical brain processes only because they belong to a first-person experience and they cannot be directly measured from a third-person perspective. So he claims there is a general boundary to what science can actually find out about human beings and about our identity. Or Thomas Metzinger, one of the leading philosophers, um, he, he admits, even though he is close to be a materialist, maybe a bit more uh, open to some non-material processes, the problem of consciousness constitutes today the ultimate frontier of human striving for knowledge. What is exactly consciousness? Is it caused by material processes only, or is it more than that? And of course, this question is related to the question whether artificial intelligence is able to develop consciousness. Because either you just need enough neurons and the right connections to produce consciousness, or machines can never ever exhibit consciousness. Consciousness is a bit like our nice cat. You know that there is a bird hidden in that picture, but you just don't see it. Because the bird is inside the cat. And you cannot look inside the cat from outside. Going back to the computer, white slides again. Can a computer be consciously aware? Again, a very interesting thought experiment. Let's travel to the future, and there is a scientist called Mary. She has been born colorblind. She has never been able to actually see colors. She only sees gray, black, and white. Frank Jackson, who has developed this thought experiment, um, he just says, well, let's assume she knows all the data because she was so keen to learn how color seeing works that she has studied physics, chemistry, biology, physiology, psychology, everything. Everything you could know about seeing colors. She knows everything, but she cannot see colors. And now let's assume that one day in the future it is possible to do a surgery on her brain maybe and connect something that was not connected before and suddenly she can see colors. She sees red and blue and green. Her knowledge has not changed at all. The, the equations of physics are still valid. The elements in chemistry and the reactions are still valid. All that has not changed. She has known everything because it's in the future. We don't know yet everything of course but let's assume in the future that's the case. And still, the question is, has she learned something new, something that she didn't know before? And the answer by most philosophers of mind would be like David Chalmers or here Christina Ausserau, who has done her habilitation on that, a Swiss um, philosopher and theologian. Complete scientific knowledge does not imply knowledge about the qualitative aspect of the states of our consciousness. The existence of conscious experience is an additional fact. Or as we say in Germany, um, probieren geht über studieren. Have you understood? To experience something is more than to study something. Because to study only works from the distance, from the third person experience, but to really experience it, to probe it, to test it, like a cake or something, is more than that. So the conclusion from that argument would be computing power is not and will never be sufficient for consciousness. Also, David Chalmers, one of those leading scientists in the philosophy of mind, would confirm that. A frequent argument that you can come across is usually, well, okay, take away the brain and there is no consciousness. So the consciousness is definitely connected to material processes. To some degree that is right, but how do we know that? For example, there are people, like even some doctors, and there are thousands of publications about that by now, who claim that there is the phenomenon of so-called near-death experiences. This is a very difficult area because there is no way to verify that scientifically. But people who claim to have experienced something, like watching a car accident next to the hospital, while they were resuscitated within the hospital. And the data that they actually talk about seem to be correct. Either there is fraud behind that, 
course, we can never exclude that. Maybe the doctor and the patient somehow dealt about that and said, let's earn some money with that. Or it really takes place. We just don't know. So there's some evidence that maybe consciousness can go on without the brain. But philosophically, and this is, of course, uh, a more stringent argument, let's use the analogy of a TV. Let's assume my cat likes watching documentary movies on climate change, like polar bears here in the Arctis, in Ar Arctica. Um, and I don't like that because I want to play with my cat. And so I decide I destroy the television. Of course, the TV program has gone now. But is the TV program itself explained by the electrical circuits in the TV? No, the TV is only transmitting the program. When the TV is destroyed, there is no program, yes, but the program itself is not part of the TV, but it is only transmitted via the TV. And so, in the philosophy of mind, one would say mental content, like the TV program, a lot of ideas, have a mental origin. It's not material in itself. And so, we can also say human beings are probably more than just biological algorithms. They are more than just computers. Even though we can follow logical operations, as a computer can do. So the computer simulates a certain part of human behavior. We are more than biological algorithms. We experience feelings, we experience desires, we have moral values, we can reason in a rational way and understand the logic behind it, while AI can only simulate these. And human beings look for meaning in life. A machine does not look for meaning in life. Because meaning in life is not problem solving, and meaning in life is not optimization. That's all that machines usually do. They solve problems and they optimize. A very nice parable is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Maybe you have read it, a great book. Um, and the answer is 42. But what's the question? The meaning of life probably is not 42, even though in Kutaisi in Georgia I stayed in room number 42 in a hotel. But I didn't find the meaning of life there, unfortunately. Where does meaning come from? And all of us look for meaning in our lives, isn't it? Meaning comes from relationship. Because my wife can tell me, you mean something to me in my life. You are precious to me. I love the way how you cook, how you care for me how we live together, how we can share our thoughts, how we can communicate and understand each other. Relationship is a prerequisite for meaning. If there is no relationship on the fundamentals of the universe, then there is no meaning to the universe. Meaning also, I think, should be moral, because if meaning is at the disadvantage of other people who suffer from me finding meaning, then there's a problem to the meaning, because it's a morally bad meaning in my life. And true meaning can only be eternal, I would say, because everything that has an end is in the end meaningless. Think about our planet Earth. In a few million years, planet Earth will be so hot because the sun is expanding and expanding due to the nuclear uh, fusion in the sun, um, that sun, the, the Earth will be so hot that no humans will be able to live on Earth anymore in a few million years. And in a few billion years, the sun will be so large that the earth will even be swallowed by the sun. And not long after that, the sun will explode. All that will just crumble into stardust and so on, and we will be gone. And so will our museums, our universities, everything we have ever done. So, no eternity, no meaning. Big questions. But what does that mean in practice for how can we use artificial intelligence in a reasonable way? I love this comic. Usually we think we are in control, in my mind. Fetch my emails, navigate to John's house, show me the news, send this photo to Lynn, and the smartphone answers, yes, master, I will do. But in reality, charge me. Give me some Wi-Fi now. I have a new email, come on, read. Answer this call, there's a call for you. And here's a restaurant, by the way, check in. And please don't forget the feedback for the restaurant, of course. And we say, yes, master, to the smartphone. Isn't that a much more practical way even to think about artificial intelligence as we uh, occur it today? I would say this shows technology is actually a tool, 
but we can be very much enslaved by that tool if we don't pay attention and remain in responsibility. Artificial intelligence is a technology. Technology is defined as the expansion of human abilities, either for good or for bad ap applications. Think about the ambivalence and ambiguity of artificial intelligence applications. They can be used as weapons or for diagnosis of cancer. And so I would say, in the end, machines or tools should not be responsible. Like my hammer would never be responsible when I hit with my hammer another person and kill that person. It's always the human being who is responsible. The final responsibility for ethical decisions always remains with human persons. We should always know whether we deal with a machine or with a human being in the internet. So it should always show you are talking to a chatbot when you ask for technical support for your system at the computer or something, or whether you really deal with a real person in online consulting and so on. But reasonable use of artificial intelligence also means thinking about ecological issues. For example, here this climate scientist and meteorologist Sven Plöger in Germany, he actually shows that energy and greenhouse gas emission of the internet, and this is the internet only, um, in 2019, actually is the third largest consumer of electricity if it was an all nation. Like first is USA, of course, second is China, and if the internet itself would be a separate nation, this would be the third largest consumer of electricity. 800 million tons of carbon dioxide are emitted. This is rank number six, equal like my home country, Germany. 3.7% of worldwide greenhouse gases, which is more than flights actually, um, go on the account uh, of the internet. Annual growth of electricity consumption by 9% because we build more calculators and larger calculators. And then of course we have these resources, rare earth metals, depletion of an Ill illegally, but illegally by child labor and so on in the Congo and so on. So there are a lot of ethical issues and I'm glad that at least there are some companies, of course not the big ones, neither Google nor Samsung nor Apple nor Nokia, but I know uh, a German company and a Dutch company who produce fair trade uh, phones um, that try to be as transparent as possible and that are also modular, that means you can repair it. And I actually have repaired my smartphone already and I could change my screen when it uh, went out of order. Normally with Apple or with Samsung this is not possible, you have to buy a new smartphone producing a lot of rubbish, a lot of litter. And then another thing is our society. I would say dangerous is never artificial intelligence itself, but the way how we use it, which means the user behind it. Like in George Orwell's 1984. We can use surveillance for the good when we just monitor our own house in order to prevent criminals from entering. But in China, all of society is mentored, not only in the streets, but even in the internet, on your smartphone, everything is monitored. And there is a social credit system which adds points and according to these points you have certain rights or you don't have these rights. Trading, everything is completely monitored via smartphones. And there's a national firewall which, information's, which information may, might be imported from outside of China and which may be, might be exported or not. Total surveillance of public space and where is privacy in this case. So it's very good that the European Union has a project called AIDA, Artificial Intelligence in a Digital Age, which basically asks the question, how should our society look like and which applications are we willing to allow and which are we not willing to allow because it changes society in a way that we don't want. So the first question we need to ask is, in which world do we want to live? And the second question is, how does technology fit into this world? The problem that we face is that technology evolves much faster and is developed much faster than the law and so on can follow. So actually it's an open question how all this will develop and of course everyone wants to be the first in developing the best artificial intelligence and no one wants to be behind. So I don't know. This is an open race. I can only challenge you as computer scientists, think about these ethical questions, think about how can we 
produce a world in which we want to live with all privacy that we need and with all ethical values that we want to keep. And my final chapter. Artificial intelligence makes me not only think about ethical questions, but about worldview issues. Just to think about that, where does intelligence come from? When we look at artificial intelligence, it took us 70 years from Konrad Suse, who developed the computer, to today. And millions of engineers have put a lot of intelligence into programming artificial intelligence. To me, the question arises, where does my own intelligence come from, come from, which in general terms will still be better than specific artificial intelligence? Where does it come from? And this question is actually not my own question, but it's a question that famous biologist Charles Darwin asked. It's famous Charles Darwin's doubt. He wrote in a letter at the end of his life, with me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the conviction of a man's mind, our rational thinking, whether these convictions, which has been developed from the mind of the lower animals over the course of millions of years by chance and necessity, variation and selection, whether these convictions are of any value or are at all trustworthy. Why can we trust our mind? If it's just the product of chance and necessity, according to the selectional principle of fitness, Think about fitness. Fitness means you are able to reproduce. So the best, uh, the best fitness has the person who can reproduce in the, most, uh, in the best way, produce the most offspring. Think about the most brilliant minds. Most of you might think about theoretical physicists like myself or about, <laughs> about mathematicians or about brilliant minds. But when you look at the reproductive capacity of theoretical physicists and mathematicians, often they have not been so successful in reproducing themselves. So the question is, how can fitness in reproduction actually cause our mind to become so successful and able to discern truth? That's a valid question. Why should we trust our reason if it's only the byproduct of natural processes? And then, of course, the question is, what is a human being? Is Yuval Harari right when he says human beings are only biological algorithms? Or are we, like the Christian tradition would say, are we living souls that are incarnated in the body, so we are more than just material processes, made in the image of God, even according to a certain design, conscious, emotional, rational, intentional, and so on. There are different worldviews, and it's important to ask these worldview questions. It's not about preaching or going to church or something, but it's about the reality. What is the reality? What is a human being? And according to that, there is another question. What is our problem as human beings? We realize that this world is not the best possible world. There is so much suffering in this world. Is the reason for that just that human beings have a technological problem that can be solved by artificial nanorobots? Or is maybe Nikola Tesla right? a uh, very ingenious theoretical physicist, by the way. We are living in an age of unprecedented technical achievements, leading to a more and more complete mastery of the forces of nature and annihilation of time and space. But this development, while contributing to our comfort, convenience and safety of existence, is not in the direction of true culture and enlightenment. On the contrary, it is destructive of ideals. The real cause for the fall of nations is the inability of mankind to solve the social, the moral, and the spiritual problems. This was written well before artificial intelligence was on the scene, but I think you can apply this citation into our situation today. What a prophetic statement. And we've talked about these ethical dilemmata, social, moral, and spiritual. So what is our problem? Do we have a technological problem? Or is there a deeper moral and spiritual problem in us human beings that we are simply not able to live according to a standard that allows for real love and caring for all human beings? And then, of course, the question is, how is the human problem solved? Is it solved by bioengineering, by upload of consciousness to artificial intelligence for immortality? Or do we need to find a new identity by reconnecting to maybe the one who designed our mind? As a Christian, I believe that. 
immortality through being resurrected as my true self. But that, of course, is another question and not part in today's lecture. I have gone a long road with you and I hope I have made you think a bit about the deep dimensions of artificial intelligence, brains and the future of mankind. If you want to read on, I can recommend you quite a few books uh, that you can find here. And if you can read German, you can even go to our website and find some more on that. But I thank you very much for your patience listening to me. And I am excited what questions or comments might be there on your side. Thank you very much. Can we go with two microphones, maybe, if someone has a question? You ju can just raise your hand, maybe, and ask a question or make a comment. I think this is such a vast topic, so I think there are no stupid questions. There's a question, Lana, here in the th uh, fourth row. Hello. Hello. <laughs> I would like to ask uh, questions. Two, I have two questions, actually. Uh, so, uh, I would like to ask a question uh, from the view of uh, comparative anatomy and comparative physiology. Like, um, when you are researching deeper aspects of artificial intelligence and the uh, functions of the brain, human brain, um, did you ever have some opinion that the human brain is not necessarily the most optimal version, but some more, op more um, polished version could be created evolutionary. This is one question. And uh, another one. Maybe let me first respond to that question and then okay. you can ask so, a second sorry. question because okay. I can't okay. remember all these questions. Yeah, me, step by me, step, me step by step. <laughs> My brain is not optimized for parallel answering of different questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that shows you, of course, we could think about more complex brains that are able to calculate faster or calculate differently. But actually, when you ask neuroscientists, and for example, we have done an interview with uh, Nobel Prize winner Thomas Sutov for our documentary movie, More Than My Brain, that yeah, you can even uh, watch uh, online at visionvideo.com. Um, then um, he says, we have only understood about 2% of how, how the brain works. Up to recent, up to recent understanding, um, People thought that only the neurons are actually important, but we have found out that there are billions of glia cells, for example, that are also important for our transmitting of signals and so on. So it seems that the way how the brain works is wired in a way that we just don't understand yet. So in order to judge whether our brain is optimal or not optimal, it's probably hard to decide on a physiological way as we don't know so much. But I'm not a physiologist, so I, I cannot answer that. Of course, coming from, from the application point, of course, our brains somehow can be prone to error. Sometimes we make logical conclusions that are wrong. But on the other hand, we can also find out that we are wrong if we use all our brains and discuss together. So it seems that our brains are wired in a way that we need correction from other brains, from other people. So I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, it forces us to talk to other people and not be on our own if our brains are not optimal. Second question, please. Okay, okay. <laughs> and uh, another question, please. Uh, so uh, when I would like Oh, I would like um, to address to the name of your institution, actually. Yeah. Uh, like, when you have deep knowledge in artificial intelligence, in neuroscience, in physics, in other fields of sciences, deep aspects of them, is there left enough room for faith? For faith in God, you mean? Yeah, yeah. that's a very good question. <laughs> and you're right, my question, my, my institute is called Institute for Faith and Science. And I would like to ask uh, a counter question. What should we measure in order to prove the existence of God? What should be measured? Energy. 
black energy. Well, black energy is a part of astrophysics and so on. But why would that prove the existence of God, black energy? <laughs> but that's just another mm. physical phenomenon if we are able to manage. The, the point is, think about yeah. a picture. Yeah. Imagine a very nice picture of Van Gogh. And then I tell you, um, you are all physicists, chemists, biologists, IT scientists, whatever. Please prove with your science that this picture has been painted by Van Gogh. And you can find out more and more about this picture. You can find out all the atoms and count the number of atoms, weigh the weight of the picture. You can think about all the different elements that are in that picture. But in the end, you will never come up with a proof that this picture has been painted by Van Gogh. Because Van Gogh himself is the author and the painter of the picture, but he's not a part of that very picture. So when we use methods, like physics, chemistry, or informatics, and so on, which work inside this material world, we will only find out properties of this material world. But if there is an author to that material world, we cannot measure this God, because he's the painter and outside of the painting. And so what we can find out might be traces or evidence. For example, in a picture of Van Gogh, you will find out that, yeah, there are certain characteristics in that picture that are typical for Van Gogh. So that's not a proof of the existence of Van Gogh, but that's a good pointer. And just as I indicated, the existence of consciousness might point to the fact that the material world is not everything, but that there is more to the universe than just matter. Or the existence of rationality might point to the fact that there is actually an intelligence that has created intelligent beings and has transferred the ability to think intelligently to us. Because normally physical processes do not produce intelligence. We just suppose that this must have been the case over the centuries and over the billions of years, but how do we know? It could be that some being from outside interfered and made us able to think his thoughts after him, as the first scientists like Johannes Kepler, for example, said, that we are able to understand the universe because we are made in the image of that intelligent being and can actually um, also think intelligently. Like, um, what did I want to say? Yeah, why does matter actually conform to mathematical formula? That's one of the biggest riddles in the philosophy of science. Because matter is just stupid, matter just is uh, inert, and it just behaves according to certain standards. And then we, with our minds, analyze matter, and we find out, actually, that matter behaves according to certain rational laws, mathematical laws. And these rational mathematical laws actually would even be valid if there was no universe. If there is no material universe, 1 plus 1 would still be 2. And the potential equation and the Laplace equation, all these equations would still be true because they are rational ideas. They are part of a rational universe. And the question is, why does the material universe comply and converge with the rational universe? And that's a big question. And one easy explanation might be because there is a mind who created both. Because the ideas of the rational mind are mathematical equations. And the creation and the works of the rational mind would be matter. Other issues would be matter, how stable is matter? Is matter not based on information? Like Nobel Prize winner Anton Seilinger has a very interesting paper called Bit Before It, where he claims the fundamental quantity of the universe is not matter and energy, but it's information. But that's a completely different issue. I just want to point, if you want to uh, Google for that, Bit Before It by Anton Seilinger, Nobel Prize winner in 2022 quantum mechanics. Yeah, there's another question. So the question is basically, how, can, how has democracy any chance against the totalitarian system? Sure. It is very, have you read Yuval Harari's Homo Deus? Because he has a chapter on that actually. Yeah. And he says, the difference between a totalitarian system like the Soviet Union and democracy is that in a totalitarian system, you have one large central informational hub and all information passes through this one hub. And this one hub controls everything. In a democracy, you have many different hubs and even controversial hubs because a democracy allows for different opinions. So you have a greater variety and variation. And in this way, he explains why the Western democracies have been more successful on the long run than the totalitarian state of the Soviet Union. 
um, because information was processed much in much more variety and in much more diverse ways to find out the best solutions, while in the centralized versions of totalitarian states, a lot of opinions were not allowed, because there are also rules in totalitarian states, of course. They are not without rules. That would be an anarchy, and anarchy also does not work, because you have no information processing hubs, to use Yuval Harari's uh, language. And so I think um, I would agree with Yuval Harari. I don't agree with everything he says in his book. I have a lot of different opinions, of course, as you might have realized from my talk. But I agree in this one point that from an information technology uh, side, uh, democracy is superior to a totalitarian system because it has more variety and a more diverse approach to develop strategies to problem solving. And and even more rewards, because when you develop a problem-solving strategy in a democracy, then you get very high rewards because you earn a lot of money. In a totalitarian system, it is easy that the, the rewards are actually taken by the totalitarian system and you are put to prison because you have become too dangerous. Like, think about China and Alibaba and other examples. Just to comment on that. Yeah. Thank you for this good question. I appreciate that very much. <laughs> Oh, no, there is. Um, just raise your hand and uh, you will just be next. Just yeah? a quick question. Yeah. Um, did you, uh, what do you think about this open letter? Open AI. Open letter. Open letter. Did you sign it? Uh, <laughs> I'm not significant enough to sign it, but I think I would sign it if that would make any difference. Um, the problem about this open letter is, of course, the following. I think they define the problem in the right way, like we should stop and first think about ethical rules. But the problem is, if some states and governments or companies decide we stop our development of AI and others still continue, like in totalitarian systems, it is easy that they are just uh, um, left behind. And, uh, the others who do the research go on. And if you want to talk and influence others, you need to be on the top edge. Only the people who are at the top edge will actually decide which ethics will be used. I think that's one of the basic problems, um, that in research only those are heard which are most advanced. And those who are behind and want to restrict research, people say like, ah, come, forget about it. Um, you have nothing to say because you are not fur further advanced. So I think it's very important that leading scientists have signed this letter and that we become more conscious about that and which, that we ex establish rules. But this does not mean that we have to stop research. We just have to do the research in a more cautious way um, and not allow applications to enter society too fast. Like with laboratories on viruses and so on, the viruses should stay where they are and never be released. And similar with that, do the research, uh, understand the topics, but uh, be very careful when to apply. And the application should only be done after we have evaluated ethical standards and laws. Do you think this letter is more, more kind of stunt, like uh, to, aware, or to raise awareness about the problem? Well, it has no legal uh, uh, commitment to it. It's just a statement and a warning, um, but it has no consequences. So whoever likes to follow it can follow it. But I would even doubt that the scientists who, doubt, who, who signed this letter really stopped to work in artificial intelligence. I, I can't judge about that, but I would guess that most of them are too curious about the future and about their research. There's also a question in the first row here, by the way. First of all, thank you for this interesting lecture. Uh, you mentioned and you talked about AI, uh, but I have questions about AGI. What's the current stage of AGI development and what uh, danger it can bring to the human beings? That's my question. Thank you. Yeah, this is one of the fundamental questions, especially in science fiction movies, of course, but also in general, like Stephen Hawking thought about that and Elon Musk and so on. As I explained to you, I think AGI in the moment is still a project for the future. We have developed some programs that are able to develop different strategies, like Google has developed an algorithm that can learn to play games and win in these games, but this algorithm is still not able to cook tomato soup or something like that. So it's a far way f away from uh, general intelligence. And then, of course, general intelligence is still different from being conscious. 
And I think the real danger would be if a conscious being would come out of that. But I've given you some arguments like John Seale's Chinese room example and uh, the blind Mary, colorblind Mary experiment and so on. I personally don't think that consciousness can be re reduced to material processes only. Because I have this worldview, I'm not afraid of that. If you think that everything that we are as human beings and in this universe is material, then of course it would be possible because then consciousness can only be a function of material processes and then superintelligence might be possible because consciousness could arise from material processes. But I have strong doubts and I'm not the only one to have strong doubts about that. Um, so I think we should develop uh, intelligence. I doubt that we will ever reach a state where intelligence goes beyond the state of simulating, simulating rational behavior and has real insight and real understanding of semantics because this is connected to qualia and so on. Also a thought is a qualia issue actually. Um, so I'm optimistic, but it's our call to be responsible. And as we said here, first check the ethics and then do the application. I think research can be done in a lab like with viruses and we need to be careful that they don't escape. Like maybe it happened with Corona, we don't know. Um, this can be dangerous, of course, but it should stay in the lab until we are sure it's safe. So the problem with ChatGPT was maybe it was released without thinking about the consequences. And now we have the problem that all students at school can write their exams and their essays at home using ChatGPT. And the teacher has a hard time to decide that, whether they used it or not. And so I would say to use ChatGPT wisely would mean you can use it like a search machine be inspired by it, yeah, but you should never just use the text by ChatGPT, but you should do research, where do the quotes come from, who said what, and so on. And then it's like a search engine, and it's an intelligent search engine, engine that can be very helpful. But ChatGPT is not considered to be general intelligence yet. Even though the answers sound sometimes very sophisticated, but it has strong limitations. Like, it only pr reproduces things that are in the database, and this is a huge database, but it does not create new knowledge, actually. It's only statistical correlations and so on, so it's not yet general intelligence, as the informa information scientists in the moment agree. Maybe this question is the last question, because I see a lot of people stand... Oh, there's also a question in the... Um, how do you say that? In the balcony, <laughs> in the higher regions of this lecture theatre. Okay, this question and this question, and a lot of people might want to leave, so we should maybe finish then, but I will stay here, and if people have personal questions, we can go on like that. Yeah, please. So, first of all, thank you very much for your presentation. It was too many um, panic in your presentations, and could you please tell us about consciousness uh, of German people with closed gate panic uh, experience. You talked about that, that the experience is very um, important. Closed gate? What do you mean? So I know that you have had some tradition of closing gates to left behind of s some kind of situations when... Okay. Yes, yeah, so... I, I the German uh, angst, so to say, or... Yes, so what was happening to them who was behind or w why it's so important? Because I asked ChatGPT and it told it um, concentrating on panic and fear, it's not good. We need to consider that spirit and uh, materia is the one. And a lot of scientists, including myself, we think so, so far. What is the idea to focus on panic and fear and left well, behind consequences. I, I hope that it did not come across in a way that I would focus on panic and fear because the first chapter was all about very positive impacts on AI and what they have achieved and what they can do. I think at the moment we have not the problem that we have too little fear of AI. I think most people are very optimistic, I would say, uh, in uh, regard to artificial intelligence. Um, but we don't think about ethical consequences. And like when we, when we look at China, for example, I don't want to live in China actually at the moment, just being a tourist maybe, but I don't want, don't want to live there. I have some friends who live there and they say, you are a class person because the state knows everything about you. Even as a tourist, you should buy a new smartphone and not use your old smartphone because the government will store all your data. And I don't know whether you are fearful about that or not. I'm, I'm fearful about human beings who are using artificial intelligence. That is my fear. If because they have I, panic. I distrust human beings 
who will abuse nuclear power, who will use every kind of technology for the evil purpose and not for the good purpose. Just think about what's happening in war situations right now in this part of the world. So if we panic and we have fear, that's why we could think in that way. You don't think so? Um, I, I don't understand the question. Uh, you mean if we panic, we can think in that way? Negative way. Negative way. No, I think we should always think in both ways. We should think, uh, as I said, uh, AI is a technology that is good and bad. It can be used for good and bad. It, it expands human possibilities and abilities for the good and for the bad. Or would you say it's only for the good? It's non-punitive thinking. It's a way of thinking, new thinking, when you don't know who is the faulty. I mean, you saw, uh, second, your um, slide was regarding that. Yeah, I don't think in non, it's solution-based thinking. It's not up to black and white. You don't think so? I, I don't understand the question. My, my thesis was that artificial intelligence can be used for good purposes and Only. for bad purposes. And so we do not need to panic that was my, my sixth chapter. Is AI a reason to panic? And I would argue that it's not a reason to panic, okay. but we need to think about a reasonable use. A reasonable use, yeah? That was the chapter with the smartphone at the beginning. If human beings, or maybe I should use that, yeah. Maybe I should sit down and use that, because the battery, the battery is probably empty. Um, if we use technology without thinking, we will be enslaved to technology, like our smartphones. If you just use your smartphone, then the smartphone will tell you it, it, there is a new is information. That is the way of thinking. AI is considering green planet, like it's intelligent thinking. It's not like good or bad or worse and that stuff. That is the idea. We need to be intelligent. Yes, of course, I agree completely. We need to be intelligent and we need to be the masters of our technology and not the other way around. This is very important. So why would you concentrate on panic? That was my question. We should not concentrate on okay, panic. Okay, thank you very but much. But we should think in an ambiguous way, in an ambivalent way. We should acknowledge that AI has opportunities for the future, like doctors are very grateful for AI, so to make good diagnosis. But on the other hand, we should not blindly trust AI. For example, when it comes to the prediction whether a criminal will again do a crime again. Should we just blindly trust the data that AI has sorted out from previous cases and say, okay, AI has found out that this criminal has a chance of 90% of committing the same crime again, and I think we should not rely on that. It's not blind trust. It's like love, care, and plus trust. You blind love intelligence. artificial intelligence and you care for artificial intelligence? I mean, or? I'm 100% sure that rationality is up to good. 100% sure. And there are a lot of scientists who are absolutely sure regarding that. Rationality is again an instrument that can be used for the good and for the bad. You can design a rational uh, method in order to prevent people from starving from hunger, or you can design a rational strategy in order to invade another country and conquer it. One is good, one is bad, or would you disagree with that? That is way of thinking, and that's why I would like to know what was happening to people who were left behind of that gate, because they got some panic, and you okay. made a big presentation yeah. of it. Okay, yeah. Yeah, panic itself is not the solution. You are completely right. It's not ration. It's less productivity. Uh, we are Georgians, we are having fun. Less fun <laughs> yeah, a, a, lot, a lot is not rational. I mean, joy, is joy rational? What is, what is rational? It's physiology. It is feelings, it's feelings, it's emotions, and emotions yes. are different from rational. And that's another point that I wanted to make. We are not just rational beings. We are emotional beings. We are not just material processes calculating all the time and solving problems and optimization. This is not what a human being is. We are much more than just these material, rational processes. That is the one. Spirit and material. That's, that's a worldview, that's a worldview. You can believe that, but you can also believe differently, of course. Yeah, some people believe it's one, other people don't believe it's one. So, yeah, but that's, that's a very important discussion that we should have. But there was more question from... Uh, I have from one Baltimore. more question here. Oh, from right there, here. okay, yeah. Uh, so, currently, um, humanity has evolved to a place where we are able to produce, or in labs they can reproduce some parts of the organs, right? So will we ever be able to create human brain? 
So that's a simple question right here. I don't know. <laughs> it's a very simple answer. I really don't know. I mean, there is the Blue like Brain the, Project. The whole point of the question is, is the mm, like brain just a connection of material? Or is there anything else added to it? So if we just, uh, like as you said, just get 80% of water protein and combine it, will we be able to uh, get this like brain in the future? Or it's impossible. And we need some extra magic flavor. There was a lot of optimism 20 years ago, but a friend of mine has also worked in the Human Brain Project. And uh, they actually, when you read the evaluation of that project, they have really discovered a lot of interesting facts, but they admit that they have not really achieved the goal to simulate the brain and to understand the brain. They have understood some details, but the human brain is so much more complex. That's why Nobel Prize winner Thomas Südhoff uh, says we have maybe understood 2% of the brain. We are far from really understanding the brain. We know some regions of the brain that are active at certain points, but how the brain really works and functions and how the currents and the chemicals, the hormones and all this works together and the different cells in the brain and whether we have understood all the cells, we are far away from understanding that and that's why neuroscience in the moment is one of the top sciences because there is a vast field which you can still discover and of course when you are directly in the area of research you cannot predict whether you will succeed or not. It would be hybrid to say yes we will manage or it would be hybrid to say we will never manage. I mean, but you are completely right. If the brain is not only material, then it will be probably not possible for science, which deals with material me measurable processes, to actually uh, simulate and understand the brain completely. Then there will always be something beyond scientific processes. If the brain is purely material, then uh, uh, it could be possible to simulate the brain. Yeah, but we don't know that. We, there is no proof for either or. I just showed you some arguments from the philosophy of mind, from philosophers who say the brain is probably not everything that is to the mind, but the mind and the brain correlate. But the mind can even have a causal action on the brain, because mind somehow by ideas can influence brain activity. However it's working, we don't know. Nobel Prize winner John Eccles tried to work on that. He did not find a solution, but as we do not find any uh, kind of evidence for a mechanism between a soul and a brain, this does not mean that there is no. Maybe we have to do more research and ask better questions. It's open, and that's the good thing about science. Go on, ask the right questions, and do research all here, and think rationally. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can we give a microphone uh, to the balcony, or are you, do you have a, a loud voice? You can also uh, ask with a loud voice, maybe. Uh, I can come down, yeah. Yeah, or come down. <laughs> uh, firstly, thank you for visiting us here. and. As you say, the artificial intelligence is like, uh, for example, ChatGPT work by collecting data from networks as we use. And uh, when we ask ChatGPT information that you, about events that took place after 2021, it tells that it cannot provide such information. So I wonder if it's a case of uh, some safety act or something else. Sorry, I did not understand the final thing. Can you repeat, please? Yeah, when we ask ChatGPT the newest information, information that took place, uh, events that took place after uh, year 2021, ChatGPT says that his knowledge is not uh, able to uh, give us that information uh, above 2021. So I wonder if uh, it's a case of some safety acts about collecting extra information or it's something else. Well, I'm not a programmer of ChatGPT, so I don't know. I just know that ChatGPT 3 did not have many restrictions, but ChatGPT4 includes much more, many more restrictions, also about citations that should be marked and not making up wrong citations and so on. So I think they develop a lot of restrictions. Um, probably this is something about restrictions, yes. I don't think that ChatGPT itself would come up with that idea. But I don't know, and maybe even the programmers don't know, uh, unless they have actually implemented such kind of a safety regulation. 
but you need to know it's always developed further and further. Um, and especially also with regard to when you enter, how can I kill myself and so on. Then there are a lot of safety reg regulations, of course, or how can I build a bomb in order to kill many people. Um, and it's good that they have entered these restrictions, because otherwise everyone could download uh, instructions how to build bombs or how to kill oneself and others. Yeah. Thanks. And another question, if it's possible. As many people concerned, if ChatGPT has ability to grow its no, grow its abilities, is it really the case? Can it grow its abilities, or it's just as it's programmed? This is, in the moment, a matter of discussion because what we have observed with ChatGPT is that the quality of data procession has jumped. There is a large jump. But the question is, is it a jump that grows on exponentially? Or is it just a jump to another level and it will level out? And as far as I know, there are some scientists who say one thing and are afraid that it will grow very, very much into a super intelligence. And there are other scientists who say, well, we have just reached a new capacity of calculating a lot of texts and so on and calculating statistical um, connections, but this will level out because once we have dealt with all the texts that are available on the internet, there is not much more to be learned for that. So it really depends on what you believe uh, ChatGPT actually is. And that might show whether it's a general intelligence growing into consciousness or whether it's just um, a, a specific intelligence that will continue to grow only a little bit because we have reached the maximum amount of information by using the whole internet to train it. Thanks. Yeah, but no need to panic, really. <laughs> That was the reason for the sixth chapter. I'm sorry if, if I was misunderstood. No need to panic, but be reasonable and use it wisely. Don't be ruled by artificial intelligence. That's a basic message. Thank you. I, I will still be there and I will pass on to you.